Hi, I'm David Weinberg, one of the hosts of Spotlight on Guilford. We've got a great show coming up. We're going to be meeting Guilford resident John Sales. He's the author of this new book, Yellow Earth. He's also an Oscar-nominated screenwriter, film director, actor, as well as a novelist. Uh, he's written a lot of movies that you're aware of, probably some that you're not. It's going to be a great show. If you miss them at the library, you can meet him here. You don't want to miss him. Hello, this is Spotlight on Guilford. I'm your host, David Weinberg, and we're chatting today with our neighbor, Guilford resident John Sales. Mm -hmm. He is an author. Right now, we're going to be talking about the book Yellow Earth. You may know him from his many films, uh, Mate Wan, Eight Men Out, Men With Guns, my personal favorite movie of all times, Lone Star. Uh, you've written hundreds of screenplays. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing a little background. Some of them I found very surprising. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Um, but how do you, John, how, do you see yourself as a novelist, a director, a screenwriter? All, how do you label yourself? Uh, pretty much as a storyteller. And, and the, the, the forms are different. Uh, sometimes things overlap. There are ideas um, that I've had that I could never raise the money to make a movie of. And then I'll make them into a novel. And sometimes I get um, ideas for novels from something that came out of a screenplay or vice versa. Um, but really, it's just storytelling. And you just, in the different media, you have different methods of doing that. You know, obviously, I, I can't um, have a soundtrack for my books, um, although I think it might be a nice idea. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that because I notice in this book mm -hmm. there kind of is a soundtrack. Well, there 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 is rhythm, and and uh, you know, Yellow Earth is told through many different points of view. Um, it's it's got an ensemble cast, like many of my movies do, and like all of my books do. Um, and when you're in a chapter that's from a certain person's point of view, that will have a different rhythm than another chapter. Um, so that, that, yeah, there is, you know, I, I do think of rhythm and, you know, in a musical sense when I'm, whenever I'm writing something. And you often have music playing. Yeah, there's, there's, there, you know, there's one chapter where uh, a character named Buzzy, who's a truck driver, who has, is driving on his way to the, the Bakken shale oil fields up in, in North Dakota um, from down in Texas. And um, he's very nervous about driving because he had a terrible accident years ago and he's finally back on the saddle driving again. And basically, he's just going from one radio station to the other as he goes from state to state. And then when he runs out of stations that he likes, he starts putting in his play tapes. So his accompaniment um, are mostly country western, but at some point he, he changes to gospel and you know, it, that's, that's his companion for the, the trip. Well, and I saw you just had a review in the Wall Street Journal, and it was a great mm -hmm. review, uh, and they specifically talked about that chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, do you pay attention to those reviews? Do you read them? Do they have any impact on you? You know, I, I rarely read reviews. I, 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 I stopped actually reading reviews regularly um, with my second novel. Um, I, I remember on the same day getting, it had been released in, in Britain, and uh, I remember getting two reviews, and one of them said, uh, well, I like this novel, but, you know, basically there are no major female characters. And the second review said, what I like the most about this novel is all the fully drawn <laughs> female characters in it. And, and it just seemed to me, well, you know, I'm not that interested in, because these are telling me about the reviewers, mm -hmm. not about the book. Um, so I really stop. I don't. I don't read them for movies. Um, 
people, you know, if they're really awful, people will call you up and say, boy, I didn't think it was that bad, you know, and if they're really good, they'll call you up and say congratulations. So you kind of know what the score is, but I don't really um, read them very much. And they help sell books, which is great. So you mentioned that sometimes a screenplay leads to a novel mm -hmm. and vice versa. Do you, and you wrote a book called, is it, uh, I have Thinking in Pictures. Mm -hmm. So do you see the movie first or, does, or do you write the book? For, how does that work? They, you know, they, they all evolve. I start with an idea um, in, the, in the case of Yellow Earth. Uh, the idea got stuck in my head probably 30 years ago or more, uh, there was a, um, a, a kind of similar shale oil boom in Wyoming. Mm. And, and I had friends who lived in Wyoming and I was hearing a little bit about that. And then I ran into you know, kind of a similar thing after the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska. There was a boom in Ketchikan because the government was paying people a lot of money to clean it up. Um, and then my last novel, um, uh, a Moment in the Sun, the opening chapters are in the Yukon during the gold rush. Um, so it was something that, that stayed in my head. Um, and so I just started with this idea of, of these kind of invasions. Um, in, in this case, it's a town city of about 15,000 people. And then six months later, it has 45,000 people and camp followers and you know the stress that that puts on a community and the law enforcement and things like that so i start with that kind of idea that i want to explore and then as i start to explore it and start to write characters start to appear and then you feel like oh well i, I kind of like to finish the arc on that character and and which of these characters can meet and how should they meet and what you know so it, i think it's always interesting for an audience or a reader to, to, to really play with that point of view. And maybe you get one chapter in that person's point of view, but then maybe later on, that, that person's just a character in somebody else's story and how they see them. So these characters present themselves to you? Yeah, they do. You know, they, 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 they kind of, well, who else would be there? And, oh, geez, well, you know, I guess this town would have a mayor. What's, what's that like, you know, to have this hap happen? You know, all of a sudden, there's a lot more money around. And so it is an opportunity in some ways, but there's a lot more problems that just got dumped onto your lap. So what do you do with that? So do you try to see the world through the eyes of that character, or are you basing your characters on people that you may have met? Uh, both. You know, I, I mean, certainly uh, a lot of characters are composites of people I've, I've known or read about or, or read something by. Um, a moment in my son, my, my, my last book was set between 1897 and about um, 1904. So everybody's dead, you know, so they weren't people that I literally knew. Some of them were famous people, others mm -hmm. not. Um, but I read a lot of diaries. Um, I, I read a lot of things written by people at the time, both news reports, but also just, just personal accounts that people wrote that I was able to find. Um, and so you start to pe piece things together and what somebody's point of view was. Um, in that book, you know, one of the major things that happens is the, the Philippine-American War. And I read a lot of accounts by soldiers who had been in the Philippine-American War. And what was interesting is their letters home and their testimonies when they were, because it's, it's where we, we first, um, you know, encountered and started doing waterboarding for instance. Mm. So there were congressional committees like the church committee, you know, after that war. And so there was a lot of testimony. And uh, about one out of three of those soldiers said, this is just awful. We shouldn't be here. We're doing terrible things. Uh, about one out of three said, well, I signed up and you, you got to do what you signed up for, even though it's I don't like job. it very much. It's my job. And about one third of them thought it was really fun shooting Filipinos mm. like rabbit hunting. Um, so you, you, you try to spread the net fairly wide so that your world in the book is populated um, by people from very different points of views. Uh, in Yellow Earth, you know, you have pole dancers and drug dealers who have, are part of the camp followers. You have people from the town. 
Uh, some of them who will make money and some of them won't. You have the neighboring Indian reservation and they get involved in this whole oil bonanza as well. Um, you have guys who work on the, the rig. You have guys who are geologists who are very highly trained. Um, you have people who run the local casino, which all of a sudden has all these workers with a lot of payday money to, to lose to them. Um, so it, it makes for a kind of mosaic. And in each of those cases, kind of like an actor who's been given a role, each of those characters, I try to say, well, how would this person see the world at this moment? And what do you, what do you owe? What do you think you as a writer owe to those characters? Um, I think you owe them their day in court. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a little easier in a book than in a movie. Um, very often actors who are day players in movies, they come away f feeling like, well, where's the rest of me? You know, it was just a spear character, carrier. And I'm always kind of interested in, well, what is the spear carrier thinking? You know, he's got a job too. You know, what's his point of view? Um, so I've, I've written a novel since this one, and uh, that's called Jamie McGillivray, and there's set, um, it starts at the Battle of Culloden and ends at the Battle of Co Quebec, so it's a big historical novel. And uh, part of the beginning of it takes place during the, um, the uprising in Scotland in 1745 with uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie coming. And uh, the last lord was beheaded after that. He was a Scottish lord. And, uh, uh, and some other you know, people lower in the, in the ranks. And so one of my characters is a guy who's basically a janitor you know, at the bar in London. And one day they say to him, look, I know we haven't done this for a long time, certainly not in your generation, but we've got these two heads and we need them to get up on those spikes. <laughs> You know, and so he's more than a spear character, and he only gets one chapter. But that was really interesting to me. What, you know, how do you do that? Because he hasn't done it. You know, there's a skeleton skull rattling up there, but that's not going to help him know how. How do you get that thing up on there? So you've worked as an actor yourself. Mm -hmm. Does that have an impact on your writing? Yeah, I, th I think I think that effort of trying to get inside the head of of, of somebody who's not you. Um, when, when I make movies, one of the things I do is I write a, a short biography of every character. So even if you've only got like a half a minute scene, you get a couple lines, you know, maybe a, a paragraph or two about who you are, where you're coming from, where you are at this moment that is not necessarily in the screenplay. And when I'm thinking about characters for fiction, I kind of do the same thing. Where's this person coming from? I don't have to put it all in the book but I have to kind of know their background. And you've acted in other people's yeah, movies yeah. too. I noticed you were in one of my favorite films, In the Electric Mist. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that was fun. Um, I, I got to the set very early. It was Bertrand Tarvinier was directing and Tommy Lee Jones and Michael Fitzgerald was his producer were in it. John Goodman was in it who had actually acted with maybe 15 years earlier. And uh, it was down in Louisiana where I'd, I'd shot a movie. And so it was just fun. And then after I left, I guess people started not getting along and stuff like that. Um, but it was, it was fun. It was being a day player and meeting the, you know, not, not just the actors, but some of the extras and stuff like that. A really interesting, you know, learned a lot uh, from a guy who had a, like a one-line part who had been uh, a diver on oil rigs. Really dangerous job. And he had finally one day decided, I'm going to die doing this. Maybe I'll try acting. You know. <laughs> so history seems to be really important to you in, in your work. Yeah, history, you know, for me, um, it's just really good stories. I mean, I am interested in it. I, I didn't study history, especially when I was in school. And so I'm catching up now. Um, but also, so much of what I write about is this attempt to figure out if people act this way or acted this way in the case of stuff that's passed, um, what can possibly be going through their head? And to start down that road, if, you, if you're going to try to really be accurate with it, you have to first say, okay, when are we talking about? Um, is this before the women's movement? Is it before capitalism? Is it before people knew the world was round? 
Is it before Marx and Engels? Is it before Freud? And because that lack of information means you can't assume anything that you now, because we've got all that stuff in our head. You have to eliminate some of those things. And then you have to look into, okay, what was life back then? You know, what, what were people's preconceptions? What baggage did they come into the world with? Um, and, and that starts just, you know, the, the bedrock of a character. And then you add their personality to it. And then you add, well, what do they want? Do, are they somebody who is in a place where social mobility is possible? Do they want to move up in the world? Do they want to whatever? Um, in A Moment in the Sun, one of the main characters is a guy who's an African-American guy, and he joins the army because he has this idea in you know, 1898 that this will be good for the race. You know, that Americans will finally accept us as citizens if we join the army and fight for the red, white, and blue. He's mistaken, but, but that's what gets him into it. And that was one of the big recruiting pushes for those guys. So this idea, social justice is a big theme for you in a lot of your work. Yeah, I think, or, or people's, people's where, where, you know, borders are interesting. You mentioned Lone Star. Mm -hmm. um, when people uh, say this is us and this is them, where do they draw that line? You know, is it age, race, sex, class, you know, wealth, whatever it is, ethnicity? Uh, when people say we, how big a we are they including in it? And, you know, being an American and having been fed the idea of America as a as a democratic place and as a melting pot and reading the Constitution and things like that. But that's a tall order to ask human beings to do because it doesn't come naturally, necessarily. Um, and so a lot of what interests me in, in history and with social justice is wh when do people feel like, well, we can't bother with that now. We've got something else too important to do or, or that's going to ruin everything if we let those people in, um, if we include that in our, our world, and in, including, very importantly, um, if I even let it into my head. So one of my, my movies, Men With, Gun, uh, Men With Guns, really is about this idea of um, willful ignorance, mm. that um, it, it's, a, it's a doctor, and he's in a, in a you know, kind of, very poor, tough South American, Latin American country, and he has trained a group of barefoot doctors to go out and work with the in indigenous people. Good thing to do. Uh, and then he kind of discovers that one by one they've been killed by his own government. And he's like friends with generals. He goes to cocktail parties with these people. And he goes out to see, can this be true or is it just a rumor? And in fact, he finds out it's true. Well, he can't go back to those cocktail parties anymore now that he knows it. And to a certain extent, he could have known it before if he really dug a little deeper, but he didn't want to know. So that's kind of a theme in Yellow Earth also, right? That some of the Native American, uh, you have Harley killed there mm -hmm. as one of your main characters. Mm -hmm. And part of him is kind of an activist, mm -hmm. and part of him is yeah. He he he's somebody you know. His his main idea is we've got these oil reserves on on our reservation. Uh, we should cash in on this, but not just for the money, but to get the federal government off our backs. Their record has not been good <laughs> with mm -hmm. Native Americans, and so he comes up with this idea of sovereignty by the barrel. We're going to be so rich we can just tell the, the government what to do. They're not gonna tell us what to do anymore. And so, and he really didn't, knows the history of the tribe and knows the times that they've gotten screwed in the past. But he's also just buying this kind of neoconservative greed is good idea. And it turns out to be, you know, kind of a double-edged sword. So Ayn Rand plays mm -hmm. a role in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's a, it's actually, it's the most extreme character in the book, and that's because it's based on a real person. Um, there actually was a guy who, who kind of partnered up with somebody in, in one of the, the tribes that, that had some oil on it who turned out to be a total con man. And um, that 
per, her particular philosophy, that kind of greed mm -hmm. is good philosophy, is somebody that this guy who's basically, you know, read the Fountainhead in prison, you know, and decided, mm -hmm. you know, I th 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 that's why I'm in here because I'm a free spirit and the world wanted to crush me and you know, but I'm going to live my life according to these. He's a guy who just found this Bible, you know, and it, and it's her philosophy, even though it was kind of hard for him to get through the prose, which it is hard to get through mm -hmm. Ayn Rand's prose. Um, and it, it, it kind of represents that, that pure ideal of just pure, that, that system works if you just, you know, let it, let it be, it's going to be fine and the hell with anybody else. Um, and ironic in, in this case because um, the stuff she said about Native Americans was basically too bad we didn't kill them all off. So. In this book and in other work of yours that I've seen, this sort of social justice ideal often gets thwarted. Well, I mean, look at the world. Um, it, is, it is an ideal, and I ideals are hard to bring about, and even, even hard to bring about with people who want to bring them about, uh, much less people who have, you know, absolutely opposite agendas. Um, so it's, you know, that's what, uh, to me, what democracy is, is people trying to work toward that, trying to work things out together. But working things out together is not so, so easy. And one of the, one of the, the, the functions of um, a, a kind of narrative with a lot of point of views is you really understand, well, wait a minute, there's no way these people are going to see eye to eye. They have a totally different worldview. They're not even, you know, they may be talking the same language, but um, they don't, their facts are even different. They just believe different things. Um, so how can they ever kind of get along and do something that's good for everybody? So do you have, when you're writing a novel or, or a screenplay or directing, do you have some goal in mind for your readers or for your audience? Yeah, the, the, the goal is, first of all, for them to spend time with people they might not meet ordinarily and kind of consider those lives and maybe see them from the inside out. Um, but also just to think about things that you might have taken for granted before. You know, uh, Andy Warhol's tomato soup cans is a good example in, in graphic art. Um, that, uh, well, maybe you haven't considered this before. Um, and so rather than, you know, writing something that is just here's the good guys and here's the bad guys, you know, so many of the characters in, in, in my books especially, um, they're a pretty mixed bag. And, you know, they're in these very tough situations. There's often not a, a right way to go. <laughs> there, there's two bad things to do and you have to pick the one that's going to be less bad, you hope. Um, and you, you, they don't see the big picture. They see their picture, and and it may be narrower or wider, but they don't see the whole thing. And so, you know, like like all of us, we don't know what's going to happen yet, n next. And ten years from now, we'll say, oh, if we'd only known this at the time, it was knowable, but we didn't happen to know it. Um, now I have to tell you, I saw Lone Star, and it really changed my worldview huh. because I saw what you're talking about that it starts it leads you to believe things are one way and as you get further and further mm -hmm. you discover no there's a community here that goes a lot deeper and the relationships are much more unexpected mm -hmm. and surprising and intimate mm -hmm. than anybody might imagine at first mm -hmm. glance so I've, sort of brings me to two questions. One is, if someone, you have fans, I'm sure I'm not your first mm -hmm. fan because you've got this whole body of mm -hmm. work. What's your response when somebody tells you something like this? Well, it's, it's great. I mean, because what, what you want is for people to think about things in a, in a different way, or at least from a different point of view. Um, you know, one of the things I've been fortunate, I, I went to a very mixed high school um, there were people from a lot of different walks mm -hmm. of life, a lot of different races and backgrounds and religions and, and stuff. Schenectady. And Schenectady, New York. Uh, I've lived in a bunch of different places. 
Um, so I've, 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 you know, I lived in Atlanta. I lived in East Boston. I lived on the West Coast. You know, I've, I've been to every state in the union. Um, uh, and you get, you know, you spend a little time with people. You look around, and you, you get, get a feeling for a place. Um, very often now, when, when we make movies, if we're going to make it in a place, uh, I don't finish the script until I've gone there and hung around a little bit and said, oh, that's interesting. I, I wouldn't have thought they would have had this here or this is you know, the way. And, and we often, with a screenplay, um, we were in Louisiana, we, you know, we had local people read it. We were in Ireland, we had local people read it. You know, and they might say, well, you know, that's, you wouldn't translate Gaelic that way or, or you can't ca catch catfish in this month. You know? uh, in Alaska, you know, I had a, a, a big part of the plot was about a guy who'd been on a boat that had sunk and seven years later, he was gonna, you know, get a job captaining a, 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 a purse saner, um, which is a, a, a method of, you know, catching salmon. And uh, local people said, you know, nobody would hire him to do that if he hadn't been on the boat for seven years. But a gill netter, which is a two-man operation, and was like kind of like pulling up a roll of toilet paper behind you, they'd hire him for that. And, and we were able to make that change, and it, and it made total sense for the character. Uh, and was cheaper as well. So that kind of brings me to the next question, which is you're a Guilford resident. Mm -hmm. This is Spotlight on Guilford. Why Guilford, of all the places that you could live and have lived? You know, we, we had some friends who had bought like a, a weekend house here, and we visited them a couple times, and uh, we'd been living with some friends in upstate New York, and their kids left home, and they moved to the West Coast, and we always felt like, well, when they move, we'll move, you know, our, our good next-door neighbors. And so we were looking for another place to live, and I wanted to live somewhere near the ocean, somewhere I could swim, you know. and. Uh, most people don't think of Connecticut having a great coast, and it has a great coast. Um, as, and we were also looking for a place that was, uh, had a very functional town. Um, and what, from our friends and from other people we met here, we, we heard, oh, these people really do a lot for their schools. You know, really, we don't have kids, but that was, mm -hmm. that was a plus. Uh, and a good library, and a nice town square, and you know, those kind of things. Um, and uh, n now that we've been here four years, we're finally getting public water. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're actually blowing up the street um, down on uh, Mulberry Point uh, as we speak. And, uh, and that'll be nice not to have to buy water. In Santa Barbara, uh, when we lived there, when I first started working for the movies, wh you couldn't drink the water either. And we were buying water and hadn't bought water to drink for mm -hmm. a long time. So you didn't have a well on your... We had wells, but it was not potable. You know, you're right mm -hmm. next to the... Oh, you're right next to... Yeah, the... and your, your septic mm -hmm. is right next to your well. And so it's, it's not recommended um, to drink the water that, that comes out of the tap. So it'll be nice when it finally gets done. So have you thought about, have you looked at Guilford in the way that you've looked at many of the communities that you've visited? Yeah, I, I mean, I look at every place that I've lived, and, and they all have their own kind of vibe. And then as you stay more and learn more from people who've, you know, maybe been here for a couple generations or more, um, you learn what it used to be like, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, how it's evolved, you know. Um, one thing in Connecticut in general uh, that's very similar to, to around where I grew up is there were a lot of factory towns that the factory is gone now. And, and those cities are having a hard time. Um, you know, it's, it's the Northeast in general has a lot of places like that. Um, and then it's kind of just interesting to see what people do to fill in, to, to try to, okay, here's what we're left with. Mm -hmm. What can we do now, you know, and, and is it possible, how is it possible, how are we going to work together? And that the ethnic makeup changes in places. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I lived in East Boston when it was almost all Italian, and now it's almost all Hispanic, you know, and that's, you know, only about a 15-year period, you know, and it changes the character of the place a little bit. One of the things that... Uh my wife and I have been here for, oh, 18 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that struck me when I first came here was 
the connection between European history and American history, which, mm -hmm. of course, the way maybe you were taught this way, the way I was taught in the 50s, there is world history and American history, mm -hmm. and never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. And then there's a place here you may have seen called the Regicide Cellar. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of that? No, no. Okay, well, so these guys, Goff and Whaley, who the streets in New Haven mm -hmm. are named after, they had been part of the court that convicted Charles II. Mm -hmm. So they were regicides. Uh -huh. And the British sent troops here to catch them. And they hid out in a cellar over on um, River Street. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Uh -huh. And it's the regicide cellar. Uh -huh. And if you drive by there, you'll see there's a sign, there's a whole, uh, I, f I forget who, there was a governor's house there. But anyway, I saw that and said, oh, this, this town is connected to something that happened mm -hmm. in England. Mm -hmm. It's directly connected somehow to Charles II. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that was mind-blowing to mm -hmm. me. Uh, and so there's sort of so much. You, I, I saw an interview with you about the Patriot. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the Patriot mm -hmm. and how the, the screenplay had to change. But there were slaves here in Guilford, mm -hmm. only they were called indentured servants. Mm -hmm. And now there's a uh, project, I think it's called Memory Stones, yeah. where yeah. they're being placed. Mm -hmm. So it's, I just wondered how you, as someone who's really interested in history, was mm -hmm. looking at the Yeah, well, the, this next book that I've written, Jamie McGillivray, um, you know, eventually what happens is the main character, instead of uh, being hanged for being a rebel um, against uh, King George, he's uh, transported um, and he um, manages to, um, he's sent to Georgia colony in basically indentured servant for life, escapes with some other rebels and some African Americans is captured by the Shawnee Indians, sold up the river till he's sold to the Delaware Indians. And then because he's a linguist and he already speaks, you know, English, Scots, Scots Gaelic, and some French, um, he learns Lenny Lenape, which is the Delaware language, and becomes their translator and advisor when they're deciding, um, well, here's the French and Indian War, which side do we go with? <laughs> you know? And obviously he doesn't want to go with the, the English. Um, and, th and this area is really rich in that kind of history, mm -hmm. right? Where Europe and, and the indigenous people kind of met. Um, one of the things that, that um, gets left out a lot of those early histories was that the diseases, the European mm -hmm. diseases that were brought by uh, Cabeza de Vaca and various other people in, in Florida and, and Texas took a while to get to the East Coast. But when they did, they were so virulent that they didn't decimate the population. Nine out of 10 people on the East Coast died. So by the time the pilgrims got here, many of those, those you know, tribes were a fraction of what they used to be, um, or they were combinations of some tribes that had to come together for self-defense because so many people had died. And their farms were just sitting there, exactly. already tilled and cultivated. Exactly. And yeah. Pete, there are a lot of on this coast. There are a lot of oh, we just went into. There were these things buried under the ground, and nobody in this village it had been abandoned. You know, and in some cases it was for the season, and in some other cases it was the survivors after a big die-off of of people from disease just decided this is a bad place. There's a bad vibe here. Mm -hmm. Bad medicine. We're getting out of here, and we're leaving it. Right, well, and that's, there's this period of American history that's missing from mm -hmm. the time people first came here in Guilford, 1639, mm -hmm. and then it just skips the 1776. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, you know, I, I, I remember, um, you know, g getting New York State history, and it was, you know, it pretty much the same thing. You know, it was, uh, you started with the Dutch, you know, down around mm -hmm. Manhattan, and then you skip to 1776. So I read in your biography, it says you were a very bright child. 
Yeah, I, I, I must have been because I, I was so lazy in school that, and I still passed everything. So. And, and you said that you read your first novel at nine. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is I, I like to read. Um, I, I especially like to, to read books that had pictures. So I remember reading a, a, a Treasure Island with N.C. Wyeth drawings mm -hmm. in them because then, then you took those pictures and you extrapolated them through the book. But I also would read adult books. You know, my parents would have pack paperbacks lying around right. or whatever, and I'd read those. And I'm sure I understood maybe a third of what I was mm. reading. I could, I could kind of know what the words were, but that there was just adult stuff that I just didn't get yet. But I just keep plowing through because, and sometimes they would be things like the King Mutiny, which I'd seen the movie of. Uh -huh. You know, and so the the you know I could imagine the you know the people in the movie as the characters. Um, but yeah, I I, I I think I read. I was reading children's books and adults' books at the same time. So you had seen the movie and you're reading The Cane Mutiny mm -hmm. and then you're re-picturing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Or Treasure Island or mm -hmm. you know any of those things. Uh, and some, it didn't have to always be something that... Um, I remember one of the books that kind of the first time I, I was reading the, the book of the um, Black Stallion. I think the author is James mm -hmm. Farley, which is a yes. kid's book. And um, and it was just a, a great, I liked animal stories. And so it was a, a really good animal story and a kid and a horse and everything. And you're going along and he's telling it in this kind of omniscient way, but you're really into the kid and the kid's relationship with the horse. And that story all leads to this race where the horse, the, the stallion is being pitted against these two other great horses of the time, the two other best race horses. And all of a sudden, the last chapter, James Farley, the author, decides to tell it through the point of view of a, an old guy who's the handicapper at the racetrack. And it starts something like he'd always wanted to handicap a triple heat, you know, and, and to adjust the weights so that, you know, that, that three horses would be nose to nose to nose. And, and it was like, why am I hearing from this guy all of a sudden? <laughs> and it really was suddenly where I, I got very conscious all of a sudden of technique because he did it so well mm -hmm. that you still had the emotion of the race, but there was this little distance because you're seeing it through this guy's eyes. Of, and he's not rooting for the, the stallion to win. He's reading, rooting for to be a triple tie, exactly. And the last line is something like, he should have put another eighth of a pound on that stallion. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Um, and then the, the, the second one was when I read um, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I was, I was later in the play playing uh, Chief Bromden, the Indian guy. And um, uh, there's a point in the chief's point of view where uh, right in the middle of a sentence he changes from past tense to present tense. And at first I thought it was a typo and then I realized, ooh, what did he just do there? You know, and, and, then, and it made, you know, that, that, I think I was conscious of technique fairly young. And you seem to be very interested sort of in a sense of place and the history of that place. Yeah, I think from, from moving around, we had relatives in the South. We used to go down South when I was a kid. Um, just, to, just to, you know, I, I remember... Uh, there used to be a show called Romper Room, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, it's a national show like all these other shows, and we went and visited some cousins in Florida, and Miss Diane had a southern accent down there, and she was a totally different person. And, uh, and when we took the train down and got to Washington, D.C. train station, uh, I wanted to have some of the colored water because I thought it was going to be Kool-Aid. And somebody said, that's not for you. And I said, yeah, it's, it's with a jip. It's just clear like everybody else. And then they explained to me. And it was like, oh, boy, that's a weird trip. You mean, and all of a sudden, all the black people were not in our car anymore. They were in the, in the, in the back cars of the train from Washington, D.C. on. Um, that kind of perspective started me thinking about, well, the, where you, there, there is a culture where you grow up. And it's different in different places, and that affects who you are and, and how you think about the world. Well, there are scenes in Lone Star where you have the camera zoom in 
uh, one that really made a big impact on me. You have the camera zoom in on a basket of tortillas. Mm -hmm. And when you zoom back out, you're in the same place, but you're in a completely You're in 1957 all yeah. of a sudden, yeah. Well, I, that, that, I use that technique throughout that movie basically just to, to underline the fact that people are carrying the past with them. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not gone. You know, nobody comes into the, this world without that kind of baggage. You know, there, there's no tabula rasa. You come and the minute you're being, you're hearing stuff, you're hearing it in a certain language, there's certain rules to the world around you, and those you think are the rules for everybody until you learn differently. But the rules that you learn, you know, in Savannah, Georgia in 1957 are different than the world rules that you use and you would learn if you're growing up in New York City today. Um, you know, um, in this book, you know, uh, the place um, is is North Dakota. It was, uh, you know, I have four sections of the book, and each one starts with a different boom bonanza that happened in that place. And the first one was beavers, you know, for, for the beaver hat trade, you know, and then it was buffalo, and then there were, you know, these bonanza farms, you know, and then the oil hits. Um, you know, and, and each of those affects the same exact ground, you know, in a very, very different way. And the culture is different, you know. Who, who's living at that one place has a very, very different take on the world because of that boom, but also because of the era that it's in. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, as homogenized as we've, be, we've become because of mass media and now computers and stuff like that, um, a lot of the edges are, are being, you know, kind of rubbed off of the differences between people in different parts of the country. But there's still, there's still very distinct cultures and subcultures. Um, people who are into NASA is a culture. You know, people in the military is a culture. It doesn't have to be geographical, necessarily. Now, it's clear you do a lot of, in this book, you do a lot of in-depth research. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you do that? Well, some of it, some of it, you know, I've been through this part of the world, you know. Um, some of it now is easier because you can go online mm -hmm. and, you know, a satellite will take you down the block. And, you know, I wrote a screenplay once um, and I had a chase in Hong Kong and I was able to have the camera go down the street in Hong Kong. And, oh, there's a, you know, there, there's the ducks Google hanging Earth. in the window. Yeah, using Google <laughs> Earth. Um, so there, there's a lot more you can do. For a uh, moment in the sun, I probably read 100 books. Now, that doesn't mean I read every page of them, but some of them were novels written by people at the time. Mark Twain is a small character. You know, uh, in my next book, um, you know, Fielding is a character, and, and, you know, I read some of his books that were written at the time that I'm writing about. Um, they might be diaries. Uh, I remember one of my characters in... in um, uh, uh, a moment in the sun is a, a linotype operator. Linotype is very, very new. And I read a 1903 manual on how to run a linotype machine because I had to know what, what is that, mm -hmm. you know, and it's kind of fascinating. But I didn't read every line, just enough to be able to do that chapter. Um, I might have to read a book about, um, oh, you know, for the Philippine American War, the Krag rifle, which was what the standard you know, issue rifle was, and I've even like held one and seen, you know, and, and it's has a little a, bit of that. And yeah, and and this, and this I, I had to learn a lot about fracking and mm -hmm. um, what what t you know the up to date uh, methods of shale oil recovery are. And it's very technical now. You know, it's more expensive than traditional drilling, but there still is a lot of traditional drilling, you know, going on there, and the economics of it. Um, I read a lot of um, oil field bulletins and technical manuals and things like that. Um, you worked some of that, actually. Oh yeah, it? oh yeah, I mean, and it's and it's a big part of the story. Um, I came across a wonderful blog by a woman who, um, it, you know, does the circuit as a pole dancer and started getting those women to share with each other. So this is Jewel? Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, that character, you know, and, and just kind of say, well, make sure you get paid up front in this joint and don't work in that mm -hmm. joint. And, you know, this is what, you know, you should know before you sign this kind of contract and, you know, really sharing information for e with each other. So there is a lot available. You just have to keep digging. 
And then the, what I've especially found out about history, um, especially in the last in the last book, um, was when you read something um, that's stated as a fact, keep digging. Uh, what you may find is that it's stated as a fact in three books that came before, and that's where they got it from. And when you get to the original one, that person wasn't there. <laughs> they made it up. There was a lot of fake journalism um, in, in 1898. There, you know, the uh, papers eventually said, oh, Richard Harding Davis, Stephen Crane, it's expensive to send them over there. They're having lunch on us. They're having a great time. Who knows if what they're filing is honest. Let's just, you just, you kind of <laughs> know what it is. Just, just write something colorful. And people would make stuff up. Um, and then sometimes people make stuff up because they come from one side of a conflict or not, and it's propaganda. So you really do have to kind of keep digging and digging and digging and comparing and asking who's the source and, and then make your judgment about is this accurate, did this actually happen, or didn't it? Uh, now, do you have a, a particular age do you have a sort of a fallback age for your characters that you're more most comfortable writing or no no i think i think what's kind of fascinating is to think about you know the the way people's thinking changes with age um that uh you know uh i know a lot of people in their 80s now and they can tell you great stories about you know the korean war really, really accurate, or about a football game they played in high school. Um, they're not so good about what they did yesterday, you mm -hmm. know. Um, when, when you're dealing with a little kid, you know, it's a very, very different thing. They, they have different concerns. They have a different sense of time. Um, you know, what, one of the great things you asked about, you know, being an actor um, before, um, one thing, I, I was in two different productions of, of Mice and Men. And in one of them, the first one, I played Candy, who's an old guy, and he, he, he's afraid there's no pension or Social Security in those days or whatever, and he's afraid he's just going to be thrown out in the street and starve. You know, and so when he hears these guys planning to buy their own farm, he kind of says, well, I got some money saved, and would you take me on? You know, I could, I could help out. Um, and then the second production I was in, I played Lenny, who's the retarded guy who's, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, kind of the, one of the centers of the action of the play. Well, it's the same play. It's the same universe. You walk into that same bunkhouse. The sets weren't that different. Um, and they were both good productions. But what I heard and what I saw was totally different. Mm. You know, my ears would prick up. You know, and it's, yes, you are waiting for your cue, but also when you're playing that character, there's just stuff that, that happens that doesn't have anything to do with you. So if you're Lenny and they're talking about something you're not interested in, which is most of it, you don't even listen. You're playing with your mouse or whatever you're doing, you know, your, your real mouse, not your computer mouse. Um, if you're the old guy, there's scenes you're not in and I didn't even bother with those. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of the, the, the things that I, I am very interested in is who is this person, how old are they, you know, where are they coming from, what's, you know, and what's their concern of the moment? in this scene. So and you have three teenage girls or central mm -hmm. figures in mm -hmm. this book. So w what do you do to sort of make sure that you're portraying them in an authentic? Well, what you do is you think about, you know, girls you've, m you've known at that age, ones who are that age now and ones that you used to know when they were that age or grown up or whatever, and their relationships. Uh, you know people who are sisters. And they have, you know, there's a, there, there is a, a power dynamic with any, you know, one, one of my movies was called Casa de los Babies. And it was about seven women who were down in a, a you know, Latin American country waiting to adopt babies. And they're women who never would have hung out together or known each other except for that. And they're stuck in the same hotel. And they're the only English speakers there. And so they spend a lot of time to each other. And so a lot of what that movie was about was about the the kind of power you know who's with who and and you know who can stand who and who can't stand who and you know how they act when they're together and how will they act when they're in smaller groups and stuff like that and so these three girls it was important that there are three girls and they have a certain relationship and they they have 
you know, very different backgrounds. You know, one's a Native American girl with, with very fundamentalist Christian parents. Um, one's a girl who just lives with her grandparent, her grandfather on a farm. Uh, and is you know, like could go to college and is really smart and everything like that, but is also kind of used to do 4-H and stuff like that, and is just kind of you know hates the idea of leaving her grandfather, but knows she has to, and he's being pretty good about it. And the third one is this Indian princess, who's the the daughter of the guy who's the head of the you know the the um, the council at the at the reservation, um, who's kind of spoiled, um, and they all managed to be friends, but there isn't going to be a dynamic between them. Um, so, so one of the things that you, you always try to do is, is who are people in their community and who are their allies and who are their, and who are the people they just don't care about? You know, they're, they're oblivious. I remember um, in, a, in our, um, our movie Limbo, uh, I had a scene between um, a mother and a daughter, and she's a 14-year-old girl, and and her mom's a, you know, like a, a cabaret singer in, in uh, motels and hotels and stuff. And what I said to them is, look, you have these arguments during this. And just remember to the mother, um, when you say, honey, it's not the end of the world, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, she's 14 years old. What you're talking about, it's the end of the world. 14-year-old, you know, something that's a social thing mm -hmm. that you're telling, no, you can't do that, that's the end of the world. So, so a lot of it is really, really, really thinking through the people that you know and, and a applying to the situation that you put them in. So you have a wonderful scene between that character, Fawn, mm -hmm. and her father. Her, her stepfather. Her stepfather. Mm -hmm. uh, and it it works, it's unexpected. The result of it mm -hmm. is unexpected. Uh, does that come to you, or do you go through that process of saying, how would these two characters act in this situation, or do you just see the scene? You know, there, there is a bit of, imp I, I don't do improvisation in my movies. I do it in the, in the writing before we start mm -hmm. to do them, so the actors really, here's the part, do it, you know, um, and figure out who you are within the written lines. But as I'm writing, um, once you, you put these people in a room together, in a scene together, and you kind of know who they are, you start them batting the thing back and forth, and it just seems like, well, of course he'd say that. Mm -hmm. and, and how would she react? And so you discover things because you know who the characters are now. Um, so there is, a, there is a lot of discovery to it. You know, I, I don't quite say the characters start writing themselves, but it comes close to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you really, you've, you start to feel like you, you have a responsibility toward them, you know, that like they're waiting for you, and, and they don't want to be saying, where's the rest of me? You know, they, they, they want, you know, their day in court. Um, but, but also, uh, well, of course. Um, so in Lone Star, um, the first draft I had was a little short, and it was because I didn't know who shot the sheriff, which is the big mystery mm. of it, you right. know. And then one night I just went, well, the deputy shot him. <laughs> you know, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and everything made sense. And, and, and I looked at the character and said, yeah, that's, that's, of course that makes sense. But um, once again, that was one where I didn't really know exactly where it was going. All I knew was, I had this character who was going to have two things going on. You know, it, it, the the that particular story has the it's a it's like a, a mystery. So there's a lot of scenes where he's going and interviewing people. And where were you on the night of February mm -hmm. 27th, 1957? But he's really asking is what kind of human being was my father, who who I have this chip on mm -hmm. my shoulder about. And what I was interested in is. You know, that there, there's this, this long kind of um, from um, death of a salesman on, this long tradition of exposing the rot. And, mm -hmm. and this guy actually finds out, oh, my God, my father was a better guy than I thought he was. Uh -huh. It was much more complicated than I thought it was. And that's going to be almost as difficult to deal with as if I found out that he was the son of a bitch that I thought he was. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you choose the names? 
You, you you work at it. I mean, I'm uh, in in the the next one, Jamie McGillivray. You know, I, I read a bunch of Dickens before I went in there, and and he's great at names, and some of them are more humorous and whatever. And and you try to just kind of get a, it, it, every once in a while, you you it's just oh, I got to change that name. It's just it doesn't just seem like the person. So some of it is looking at the time and the place and what kind of names people had. Um, so. Um, you know, when I went to high school, there were still black guys named Roosevelt. You know, nobody's named their kids Roosevelt anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know the they they name him DeAndre or something like that. So you, you know, there, there's that kind of naming. Uh, but then there's also okay, you know, what what ethnicity are they? Um, w is there something you know that you can Give so you just you, you get the feeling for it. Mm -hmm. You know, Dickens once again is really really good for that. You know, you know Dexter Studge or whatever he names right. something. You know, it's just like all so of a sudden. So your truck driver's named Buzzy. Yeah, and and he's he's mm -hmm. like Don Knotts. You know, because he's nervous because he's had this terrible accident and he's just really nervous to be back. You know, behind the wheel of a truck. Um, you know, it it takes a while. And you mess around with them, and and you know until you find something, and especially the smaller characters, you try to give them a name that's not like anybody. You know, there's there's maybe 250 characters' names, including people you never meet in this one. Mm -hmm. um, so you want them to to not seem like the same. So by the next time you see that person, you want to know, yeah, that there's something distinctive about that name, and the and the reader will remember who that is. Uh, I had the same problem in. Um, the movie Eight Men Out, where I had a bunch of white guys with short haircuts, mm -hmm. um, all the same age, playing baseball before there were, certainly before there were names, but even before there were numbers in some cases on their uniforms. And so I ended up in the first third of the movie introducing each character three times. You know, and still there's people who say, no, wait a minute, was John Cusack at third base or what do you see in <laughs> center field? So. Now, wildlife, you have character, wildlife mm -hmm. characters in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, what, one of my main um, uh, characters is, is this woman, Leia, who is named after Princess Leia in the Star Wars. She's of that age. Um, and uh, she's a field biologist, and she happens to be in this area of North Dakota um, studying um, groundhogs, I mean um, uh, prairie dogs, uh, and she's got a coterie that she's numbered with spray paint and everything, and she comes in, like a lot of field biologists, she's studying behavior, so every five minutes she writes down what her, her subjects are doing and you know is going to try to make some kind of consensus out of this and study certain things. And she's got a, a little grant and everything, but she's pretty lonely. All of a sudden, there's um, people putting police tape around her, her coterie, around the whole colony of them, and, and they're going to kill them all because the rules are that you can't just bury them and put up the oil rig. You have to kill them first and then bury them and put up the oil rig. And so when she comes out of the field, she's literally looking at people or at men as, yeah. as prairie dogs. Yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a chapter where she's in a in a, a local diner after the invasion has has started, and and she's not from there, you know, and and, and she certainly has never been around this kind of oil boom, you know, culture before, and so. Uh, you know, she she kind of just sits there and she takes out her notebook and starts every you know des describing these strange creatures around her and their behavior, and there and th there is um, there is a big difference between um, a diner that's full of all men than a diner that's kind of mixed male and female. Um, one of the things that I, in, in my movie Casa Los Babies, there are very few movies about groups of women. There are a lot of movies about, mm -hmm. you know, baseball players or army poor guys or whatever, uh, about groups of men. But there are very few that are about, you know, groups of women not related to each other. Um, and the dynamic is very, very different. Um, and so it's one of the things that kind of strikes her is, well, this is, this is field behavior. 
<laughs> you know, this mm. is this is a whole scene, and it's a culture, and there's a lot of display, you know, book display behavior in here, and uh, I may not be able to get a grant for it, but it's kind of interesting, and it's also if she's writing something down, maybe people won't come and hit on her <laughs> because it looks like she's doing something. Now, a lot of your characters in Yellow Earth and in your other work are often looking at rules. People like to think that they want to be free and um, not have a lot of rules, and then very quickly they start making rules, and usually rules to benefit themselves and you know mm. keep their own toes from being stepped on. Um, I like the HBO series Deadwood because the first two seasons there's mm -hmm. no rules, right? And people are getting killed left and right. And then finally, some of the people who have kind of gotten to clawed their way to the top or murdered their way to the top say, we should have a sheriff and we should control him so he can get rid of the people that we don't have to murder them anymore. He can throw right. them into jail for us or whatever. Yeah, there's a wonderful scene in Deadwood where uh, they're all threatened by Hearst, mm -hmm. by George yeah. Hearst, and they convene a community meeting mm -hmm. and they eat canned peaches. Yeah. And they are saying, what do we do about Hearst? And, and these are all these people who are murderers and killers. Yeah. And, and they finally conclude that they're going to write a letter to the editor. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes away content. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's not going to do much. But, but there, you know, this, this idea of rules is, is um, I think it's you know, kind of what we're dealing with a lot in our politics today is how much, how much regulation do we, you know, so, um, you know, nothing could be more bedrock American than, than uh, pro football. Um, but pro football has so many rules now and it's getting more and more and more and more rules because they want to protect the golden egg. They don't want anybody to die on the field. You know, both NASCAR mm -hmm. and the NFL have changed rules so that even though it used to be part of the entertainment, we're seeing guys carried off on stretchers or off to the burn unit or whatever, um, they've decided, well, it's bad for business. Um, let's protect these guys a little bit more and change some rules. Um, it would be anarchy without rules. And that, that's finally what people realize is anarchy is too scary. You know, be, because I may b today be the guy who can beat up everybody else, but I'm getting a little older and I'm tired of beating people up. And, and these guys behind me are coming up. And so let's make some rules so I can hold my position. And now that's also a subplot in Yellow Earth, right? You have a guy who's a pit fighter. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 he, and he lives by this very almost kind of criminal code. Um, there's a great old uh, Howard Hawks movie called The Criminal Code. And during it, you, you just realize, oh, he's not just talking about the criminal code um, of the district attorney. He's talking about the criminal code of the guy in the prison who's not going to rat on his friends, even though that may throw him back into the prison for another 15 years. Um, rules, are, rules are, you know, Rules are really a, a great, in, one thing I noticed um, in doing uh, uh, research for another project, a movie project I wrote for some people, is if you look at the black laws of any of the southern states of what black people could and couldn't do, um, wherever there's a rule, that means people were doing it before. So the first rule is always, well, we don't care if you fathered children by this black woman, they can't inherit your property. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't make a rule saying you can't unless there were guys who were saying, well, these are my kids. I want them to have my property. Right. And then it's, no, 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 you can't do it. That's going to mess the whole thing up. And then they, they start getting more and more and more and more specific, uh, including rules for free black people. Um, if you freed your slaves in Virginia in the uh, 1860s, they had to leave the state within a year. Now, we can't have them hanging around giving the other slaves bad ideas. Ideas, and, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so I think rules are really a good way to study cultures and, 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 uh, and people's ability to live by them, want them, live without them is really interesting. So is there one question that no one ever asks you in interviews that you'd like to answer? 
Not really. You know, they, 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 I do so many, I, I do an average of like 300 interviews every time I have a movie come out. And so pretty much there, there'll, there'll be a, a basic nine or 10 questions that you answer again. And, and everybody, once in a while, somebody will come up with another one. But there's not any big gap of, oh, nobody ever asked me that. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you coming Thank on you. today. Thank uh, you. Your next book is? My next book, uh, I don't even have a publisher for yet. It's, it's oh. called Jamie McGillivray, and, and I'll get a publisher. I don't want to crowd the market. This one's just coming out. Um, I'm reading in the, at the library in Guilford tomorrow night um, at 7 o'clock. Um, and uh, I'm going to be doing a reading on the East Coast and then out in the West Coast in the next month. Okay, so by the time this airs, you will have done your reading I will. I did library, such a good but, job doing that. But you will be all over the East Coast yeah. and then to the West Coast yeah. reading. And so if people want to see you reading in person. Yeah, they should check with their local bookstore. Okay. Well, thanks again. Come back when you find a publisher for the okay, next one, good. or you don't have to wait that long. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, thank you, John.